Hello and welcome to the Benbird Prairie podcast. Uh, Benbird Prairie is a place, place of peace, Christian charity and vital history in the heart of Ulster. And we offer this podcast as an extension of our mission. You can check out our website, which is linked in the description below. Uh, please like, share and subscribe to support our ministry. And if you uh, wish to donate to help keep the Prairie alive and a hub for the community, then you can do so on our new website, which will launch in August. And in this episode of the Bember Prairie podcast, we are joined by the stellar John Sweeney. Just to begin then, John, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped form you and your love for Christ and his church then? Yeah, well, f- first of all, thanks very much for having me. It's fun to be here. Uh, and uh, yes, I'll, so let me explain something about I guess who I am. Uh, I sometimes feel like whenever I say this sort of thing, I end up sounding very confused. Uh, but I, I have a I have a sort of diverse background. Uh, I grew up in an evangelical Protestant home in in uh, Wheaton, Illinois, which which at one time and still is in some ways sort of the headquarters of American evangelicalism. And uh, I had very involved parents in that world, and I was very involved in that world until about the age of 18 or 19. And then I went as a missionary to the Philippines, and I was an evangelical or a conservative Baptist missionary to the Philippines, which means that I was there to try and convert Catholics and convince them to become Baptists. <laughs> and, and it was while I was there that I realized there was something really wrong with that project. And I also sort of fell in love with uh, Catholicism very quietly at first, but uh, I was often in people's living rooms uh, with my study Bible and trying to explain to them what the truth really was. And, you know, with all of the fervor of my 18 year old heart and mind. And they would ask questions and I would look around at their, at their home altars or I would observe their ways of prayer and, and piety. And I sort of slowly fell in love with Catholicism. So when I came back from that experience, I then went on a slow course towards the Catholic Church. And along the way, I became a writer. Um, uh, an editor and a writer, and I started writing a lot on Catholic subjects and also really fell in love with uh, people like Thomas Merton, who we're going to talk about today, but also Francis of Assisi and Claire of Assisi, and uh, I wrote books about them and about the saints and about Mary and lots of subjects that I was discovering in the way that a convert sort of discovers things. And then um, about 20 years after that initial experience, I sort of finally found my way fully into the Catholic Church. And I've just continued to to write and to speak and teach uh, occasionally on on all of these sorts of subjects. And so my my passion is is uh, the, the sorts of subjects that I've mentioned. But the reason why I'm a little bit even more confused uh, as a person <laughs> is because uh, uh, I also 12 years ago married, uh, uh, not only married a Jewish woman, but married a rabbi. So I have this strange uh, interfaith life, uh, which I think is beautiful, but it confuses a lot of people. It doesn't usually confuse me, but it confuses a lot of other people. Um, I am a rabbi's spouse, and so I have uh, a life in a synagogue, even though I'm not Jewish, um, but then I'm also a practicing Catholic and a writer and a teacher and so on. So um, I don't know. In in a nutshell, that's that's who I am. That's very diverse, Um, John. (laughs) And on that journey, John, were there any figures that were especially uh, influential along the way? Well, I mentioned Thomas Merton. So when I was a missionary in the Philippines and I was starting to have all these questions and discoveries, I was also reading a lot of Thomas Merton at the time. And the way that that began for me was that when I was turning 18, when you're turning 18 in the United States, 
I think this is still true. It was true when I was turning 18. You have to register for selective service. That's what it's called, which means that if there ever were to be a military draft again in the future, they would know how to find you. Um, and so when it was coming up to my time to register for selective service when I was going to turn 18, I became convinced that it wasn't right for, for me to serve in the military or to go to war and kill anyone because of my reading of the Gospels. And the church that I was in had no sympathy for that position at all. So I started looking around and that, that's really what got me looking around outside of my tradition for the first time in a serious way. And it was actually a Mennonite uh, pastor who, who runs a, uh, a peace center in the suburbs of Chicago, which is where I was living, uh, who put into my hands for the first time a Thomas Merton book, a book called The Nonviolent Alternative. So I came to Thomas Merton with, through his peace writings, uh, his writings on social justice and peace issues first. And then, of course, I read things like The Seven Story Mountain and New Seeds of Contemplation. And so I was really immersed in Thomas Merton from the beginning. And uh, I, also, I even considered a monastic vocation for a while uh, when I was a young man um, and I was in college. But then I, I did not follow through on it. Um, and I went to different course, but Thomas Merton had a big impact on me. He was, he was one of the first, and I think the other was uh, Francis of Assisi. I became very interested in Franciscan spirituality and began to read very widely and uh, started spending a lot of time uh, sort of immersing myself in both of those figures. Wonderful. And can you tell us a bit more then, John, about what it is about um, Catholic spirituality that you find most moving and the things that became such central concerns in your work? Well, I think the first thing I would point to would be uh, the embracing of mystery. Um, the tradition that I grew up in, I mentioned it was, you know, evangelical Protestant, and it was, it was very focused on knowing the truth and having, for instance, uh, uh, resolving your the, the destination of your soul after you die uh, once and for all uh, with a sort of simple formula that you would pronounce out loud and then you would know that you were secure for eternity. And when you're a five-year-old or a six-year-old, that feels really good. But then as you get older and you have more questions, it doesn't quite seem to make as much sense anymore. And I loved from the beginning the Catholic embrace of paradox and of mystery. So for instance, you know, at the mass, to be able to even talk about the mystery of faith as something that we embrace was really a power, it still is a very powerful thing for me simply to talk about and to embrace the mystery of faith. The idea that I don't understand it all, it's not that I'm supposed to understand it all, certainly in this lifetime. And then as for the, for the lifetime to come, I, I welcome the Catholic approach that says that, you know, when each of us is on our, on our deathbed, we have the hope of heaven. You know, we don't have the certainty of heaven, but we have the hope of heaven. So th those are the first things that come to mind when you ask that. I mean, there's lots of other things. I mean, I'm a big fan of Catholic social teaching and, uh, and the justice work that we're supposed to do to repair the world. Um, and lots of other things too. But I mean, those are just a couple of answers to you, to your question. So, uh, John, and John, if we can just uh, move on to talk about uh, some of your written work um, about uh, Father Merton, um, Father Thomas uh, Merton, uh, an introduction to his life, teachings and practices. Uh, first of all, what moved you to write this book about Father Merton and what makes it distinct from others out there? Well, what moved me to write it was that I've been sort of living with Merton ever since I was 18. I'm now about to turn 54, so that's a long time. And I had, I had never written a book on Merton. I've written a lot of books. I had never written a book on Merton. I had talked about him a lot, and he appears in a lot of my other writing. And I had edited a couple of uh, volumes of collections of his talks that he gave to the monks at Gethsemane when he was the novice master and things like that. But I had sort of put off for many years 
the idea of writing sort of my introduction to Merton. And I finally felt like I was ready to do it. The reason I wanted, to, and I deal with all of this in the book, by the way, I mean, I, I'm very upfront in the book by saying, okay, why in the world does anyone need to write another book about Thomas Merton? I mean, it does get to be a little ridiculous after a while. And I fully acknowledge that, especially as someone who makes his living in books. I mean, I get that. Uh, what, why in the world would anyone need to write another one? Um, I did this, I guess I'd say for two reasons. One is very practical. Um, you know, almost sort of an in what, what we would call an inside baseball answer, meaning, you know, like when you're in the clubhouse and you're talking to the manager and the manager gives you the inside, you know, uh, look at to why a particular play was called or something. So that reason is that it was a, a big uh, trade publisher, a big New York publisher who asked me to write this book. And I since I know all the books on Thomas Merton, I knew that there hadn't been a book by that kind of a publisher introducing Merton in probably 25 years. There's been books similar to the one that I've just written published by religious publishers. But as you know, as everyone probably knows in some way or another, a lot of people won't buy or pick up a book that's from a religious publisher. Uh, so that's kind of the, what I call the sort of inside baseball answer was that I thought there was a real opportunity to reach people. And the, but then the other answer is kind of the spiritual side of what I just said, which is I'm passionate about Thomas Merton. I want to reach people with Thomas Merton. And so I thought that I could write a book for the 21st century person who is probably generally most often unmoored from religion because of course uh, that audience is getting larger and larger every year now that goes on. I mean, in the Catholic church, well, you guys are in Ireland. I mean, it's, you know, it's probably even worse, worse for you than it is in the United States. But I mean, I remember seeing the numbers three or four years ago that said at that time that it was 5,000 fewer baptisms in the Catholic church in the U S every year upon year you know, over the year before. So, I mean, the numbers are staggering how many people are leaving the church, but yet at the same time, when you look at the statistics and things, you see how spiritually searching and questing and even sort of religiously interested people are, even though they are not perhaps involved in religion in a, in a regular way. So that is a long-winded answer to say, those are the people I wanted to write for, uh, people who I think are going to really be interested in Thomas Merton, and I don't think you would be able to reach them if you came at it in too religious of a way. Thanks for that, John. And um, then taking it back to Merton, can you tell us a little bit about his young life and how he finally found that freedom in the life of the Spirit and how that changed his life? Well, yeah, although that's I, that, would, that would take too long of an answer because that's kind of the whole, <laughs> the whole message of the book I wrote. Um, uh, Merton, Merton was born uh, uh, in a, to, a, to a, uh, a, you know, a Kiwi, a, a New Zealand parent and an American parent. He was born in France. Uh, he was educated in France and in England and then in the United States. Uh, he was experimental, he was smart, he was curious, he was rebellious. So he goes through a lot of, um, he goes through a lot of experiences, he tries a lot of things, and he gets into trouble. Uh, he gets kicked out of Cambridge University um, uh, because he has a relationship with a woman and she gets pregnant. And his guardian at the time, and that's because both of his parents are already dead, and that's part of his story too about who he was and how he experienced the world. His mother died when he was very young. His father died when he was a teenager. He was sent by his guardian uh, to, to the United States, which, which is where his grandparents lived outside of New York City. And he went to Columbia University and continued some of the same kind of uh, uh, wild, slightly wild living, experiencing jazz clubs in the 30s in New York City and 
um, not doing anything all that unusual, but nevertheless, uh, not being uh, the sort of person that we came to know later because he was trying to be free. He was looking for his freedom and his experience uh, of the world and of life. And it turned out though that he converted to Catholicism while he was at Columbia and while he was still a very young man. He was under the influence a bit of a couple of uh, professors at Columbia who were Catholic intellectuals and who really guided Merton towards the church. And once he became a Catholic, he knew he wanted to be a writer. He was a writer from the time he was a child. Um, but he also felt a real calling to um, religious life in some formal way. He tried to become a Franciscan, and it seems that the Franciscans rejected him because he gave a full confession, which included telling that story about what happened at Cambridge, and they, they rejected him for that reason. And he wept when that happened, um, but then one of those smart professors who was counseling him pointed him towards the Trappists. Uh, and, you know, to the average uh, reader today or person listening today, you would think that the Franciscans and the Trappists, you know, these are both just religious orders. They're all the same. But in those days, and still in many ways, uh, to use an analogy, the, the Franciscans were sort of the Coast Guard uh, compared to the Trappists, which would be the Marines. And, uh, and so this, this young man who was trying to experience uh, freedom, you know, in all these different ways, ended up looking for, you know, less and less of, of freedom in the sense that the world finds freedom. And he went uh, on an, a visit to the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky in the spring, and then he went back again in December uh, of that same year. And, uh, and the way he talks about it in his autobiography was that the big iron gate was closed behind him and locked, and then he was as free as he could ever be. So that's one of the themes that you encounter in Merton is what does it mean to be free? And for him, he, he wanted and he needed the, the demands. Um, I wouldn't use the word, you know, restrictions. It's more like the demands that religion puts upon you. And in his case, his religious order put upon him in order to really find the freedom that then blossoms uh, for the next uh, almost 30 years of, of what we came to know as the public figure of Thomas Merton, who wrote all those great books. John, I'm interested to know, uh, what was it that, that made Father Merton so world weary? And how does his witness continue to inspire today? Well, the world weariness comes from some of what I was just, you know, expressing a minute ago, which is he had traveled the world with his sort of vagabond parents uh, who were painters and who were trying to also uh, sort of experience the world in the way that most of us go about trying to experience the world with, uh, with travel and, uh, and, uh, and experiences, you know, going and looking for experiences and places and things to see and uh, people to meet and culture and so on. And Merton was immersed in that kind of thinking and that part of that way of living. And he also then was just sort of necessarily dragged around. I mean, he was dragged from uh, continent to continent and school to school um, from one parent living with one parent for a while and then living with another parent and then having one parent die and then watching the other parent die. And um, um, so part of it was just that kind of exhaustion. I think by the time he was 20, you know, he had lived the, lived the life in many ways that some people, you know, come to live by the end of a very long life. So he was tired, I think. But he also probably exhausted himself with his uh, sort of uh, overactive curiosity about everything, you know, whether it was jazz or avant-garde writers or um, politics all over the world and you know, he was an intellectual, you know, we don't use that word much anymore, but he was certainly what you would call an intellectual 
in his days at college. And even when he was a monk, uh, he loved to hang out with intellectuals and he continued to correspond with, with people all over the world. Um, it's worth mentioning when, you, when we talk about him being world weary, and I talk about that in my book, um, I guess it's important to also mention one of the paradoxes in Merton is that he talks about being very weary and world weary, but then he also just continues to be very involved in the world in a way that would make someone weary. Um, there's a lot of paradox in Merton, and I think that's part of what the appeal is for a lot of us is that we see in him what we often see in ourselves, which is, you know, I may say that I want to pray and I wish I had more quiet time to pray, but when I get quiet time to pray, I spend most of the time looking at my phone or, um, you know, uh, talking with a friend or, or drinking a beer and looking at the sunset instead of actually praying. Um, but then we, you know, we call it so-called prayer, I, you know, anyway, but, uh, you know, Merton gets caught up in those kinds of contradictions himself. So even after that world weariness uh, is able to dissipate with that big door closing and putting him into the monastery, you see him for decades then nevertheless get himself caught up in with, with great pleasure and enjoyment, uh, the activity of the world in a way that probably, certainly no Trappist monk, no Cistercian monk uh, in America had ever done. And in a way that I don't think a Trappist monk is even allowed to do then or now, uh, but Merton was a special case. So the, those are some of the kinds of paradoxes that I talk about in my book. And I think that's some of what makes Merton enjoyable and relatable. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, John. And then um, whenever he became a monk, what were some of the things about the day-to-day -day life that he most loved or indeed most hated? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the most hated thing, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that he... If you've ever read, and some of the best stuff to read by Merton is his his private journals that were published uh, starting 25 years after his death, which means in the nine in the 1990s they started to be published. Uh, there are seven volumes of them, and that is some of the best way to meet meet Merton is to read those journals. And when you read those, well, and including some some of the books that he wrote actually during his own lifetime like a book called The Sign of Jonas, which was a journal that he wrote with an eye towards publication during his own lifetime. Uh, he talks about being annoyed by all the noise at the monastery. And uh, what that generally means is, is uh, a problem that in some ways Merton created for himself because when he entered the monastery uh, and then began writing his autobiography, uh, the Seven Story Mountain. Well, The Seven Story Mountain was published in late 1948. So just if you remember your history, that's three years after the end of the Second World War. And it was a time when, you know, speaking of world weariness, I mean, the whole world was weary. Um, and there were hundreds of thousands of American uh, soldiers, for instance, who had just come back from Europe and from Asia and who were exhausted and had lost, uh, in many cases, sort of lost the meaning of life and were looking to figure out what in the world they were gonna do with their lives. And not to mention all of those who, uh, people who were not soldiers, but who had experienced the war still in a very real way. And there were just, you know, there were existential questions going on in a way that was unlike what had happened in the, in the decade or decades before. So when Merton's autobiography was published about, you know, this story of finding freedom and finding, finding the Catholic Church and discovering God and, you know, and, and written in powerful language, um, it's a book that is written in a, in a very powerful way, in a way that really was kind of unlike the way Merton would write later on in his life. Um, it was the best-selling uh, nonfiction hardcover book in the United States in the year that it was published, which, again, was just unheard of. I mean, this was a monk in Kentucky who wasn't really supposed to be writing a book at all, let alone an autobiography. And then why would all these people want to read it? But 
all of that is to say that he created his own problem because this book was so popular. I mean, it was 600,000 hardcover copies in less than a year that there were then a flood of young men who came knocking on the guest master's door at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky because they were interested in this life too. And so pretty quickly, the monastic community, you know, went from, I'm not sure what it was when in 1945, it was probably 50 or 60, and it suddenly was almost 300. And there, so there were building projects. Uh, they had to add space for all these people. There were bulldozers. Uh, there were even, you know, explosives to remove uh, uh, big rocks from the property in order to make room for things. Um, there was more and more farming activity because you had to feed all these people. And then there were also just, you know, pilgrims and, and so on who were coming to the Abbey of Gethsemane because it was a famous place all of a sudden. So Merton talks a lot about not liking any of that because from the moment he became a monk, even though the Cistercian tradition and the Trappists didn't really have a tradition of, of anything like hermits uh, or sort of deeply contemplative uh, uh, experience or life on one's own. It was very much a community life in the way that monastic uh, life uh, most often is. From the beginning, Merton was uh, dissatisfied with the noisiness of community life. <laughs> so that's another one of those sort of paradoxes. And so you see him sort of complaining about that. That's certainly something that he complained about. But at the same time, and I try and make this clear in my book, it, when you talk to his, his friends, Merton's friends, and there are still a few monks still living who knew him well, uh, you hear uh, uh, unanimously that he was a wonderful brother to have, that he was a great fellow monk, that he would pitch into the work when work ne physical work needed to be done, that he, it was often, uh, it was often unclear that he was, you know, the famous Thomas Merton. Uh, when he was the novice master, it often happened that a new novice or a new a monk who has just arrived at the monastery would be told that he needed to meet the novice master and he wouldn't find out until days later that, oh, that guy was actually Thomas Merton. You know, I mean, so uh, he, he, was a, he was a wonderful fellow monk, even though, you know, he would get frustrated with some of those things. And John, how did he balance uh, contemplation and action? Uh, it was a constant uh, struggle for him. I mean, um, he was... He, he was often, I think, writing to himself. Um, when, when you read some of the beautiful things that he has to say in his books, and there are many, many things that are beautiful in his books. Um, I mean, he really wrote some of the great spiritual classics of the 20th century, uh, books like New Seeds of Contemplation. And when you read some of what he writes in there, um, you have to think, you have to understand about his life that in many ways he was writing to himself. Um, when he's writing about, you know, the monastic journey and the life of one being alone and the seeking of quiet and the importance of solitude and, and all of that, he would uh, experience those things and pursue those things himself. But then at the same time, when you get into his day-to-day -day life, uh, as told through his journals that I mentioned earlier, you also see how uh, inordinately busy he was all the time. So he would have time for contemplation set aside. And he was very good at setting it aside, by the way. He would he would, for instance, critique some of his uh, monastic brothers when they would take a walk in the woods with him. You know, Merton would show them a great place to walk in the woods or suggest a great place for them to go for an afternoon to spend some time alone. And he would find out that they had taken a book with them up to the hillside or into the woods. 
and he would scold them and say, what are you taking a book for? You can read a book anytime. You don't take a book with you um, when you're going to the woods, you know, to spend time alone with God. Um, so he was very good about setting aside time. And then I guess another way to put it is that he was very good at making transitions that were quick in a way that most of us can't do so well. So he was able to, you know, spend a whole morning in contemplative practice and then visitors would arrive because visitors were often arriving, sometimes scheduled to see him and sometimes involving famous people, you know, because for the last uh, 15 years of his life, he was the famous Thomas Merton. Um, and he was able to make that transition pretty quickly in a way that, you know, many of us can't do that in the same way. So, so I mean, that's, I don't know, that's kind of a way to answer your question to sort of express that uh, he was unlike most of us in his ability to combine the two, uh, contemplative and active. But at the same time, he was conflicted, I think, often in uh, seeking more and more contemplative, but yet participating in more and more active. John, what is this, um, the wholeness uh, which Father Merton's life spoke to, and how did he attend to that, and how, we, how might we attend to this wholeness today? Well, I think I think that's what the that's what the whole purpose of this whole human journey is, is to is to find wholeness. I think we spend our lifetime doing that, uh, trying to do that. Sometimes it feels like the fragments are taking over, and then occasionally, if we're if we're fortunate and blessed, it feels like the wholeness is, is setting in. So, I mean, I think, I think sort of all, all the stuff we've been talking about here, you know, are pieces of Merton's searching for wholeness. His whole life was about searching for wholeness, whether it was around the subject of freedom or around the subject of love or around a subject that we actually haven't talked about, which is a, a major uh, primary theme in Merton which is the true self versus the false self. Um, that's something that he picked up from Cistercian spiritual tradition. And then he, he really turned it into a, a, a popular usable uh, spiritual psychological category. Um, it's, one, it's one of his real gifts uh, to us, which is this analysis of, you know, what, what makes our false self and how do, we, how do we let that go or turn away from that in order to find our true self. So all of those themes and all of Merton's life, I think, were a way, uh, were evidences of his seeking of wholeness. The last piece, which we haven't talked about, and we, you know, we might not have time to go into much, is, is that he then turns to the traditions of the East. At the end of his life, in the last few years, he becomes very interested in the religious traditions of the East. He makes some very good friends. He was brilliant at making, friend, at making friends um, across religious divides and bridging those divides. And he makes some very good friends who are very you know, famous people, like for instance, the Dalai Lama, uh, who turned 86 yesterday. Uh, we have a picture in 1968, 53 years ago, of, of he and Merton standing next to each other. Um, they spent significant time together when Merton traveled to the East uh, I look at a photo like that and I think, you know, what what would have happened if Merton, you know, would have lived another 30 years? Would it be fascinating to know? Um, but anyway, um, that search for wholeness uh, in Merton's case led him uh, at the end of his life. He died by accident, so it didn't it didn't necessarily have to be the end of his life, but it ended up being the end of his life. Was uh, discoveries in the East of 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 uh, religious tradition and text and religious figures and just an Eastern approach that deepened the contemplative uh, qualities in Merton in a way that also then has come back into Catholicism and Catholic spiritual uh, teaching and practice because we've all been reading Merton after his death and, have, and he's helped us discover some of those riches too and then also find the way in which some of those riches from the East, actually we can discover in our own tradition, 
if we go back to the right sources. So anyway, uh, I, I think the whole of life is that search for wholeness. Merton's whole life was that. And I think our lives are also about that. And that's why we enjoy and turn to Merton so frequently. Great, thank you, John. And then um, regarding us today, what are some of the new challenges from things like the internet in finding this wholeness and our true self and distractions that in many cases weren't available in Father Merton's time? I think if I had a good answer for that one, you'd have to pay me a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, uh, I, um, you know, the, 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 I don't think it's just the internet. I actually think, I think to, to, to say the internet is almost like a, a 10 year old, uh, 15 years ago, posing of the problem. I would say it's the mobile phone. It's not the internet. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the distracting, uh, piece of candy device that sits in your pocket or sits in your hand. And, you know, we can't have an experience without recording it, uh, or sharing it. Uh, we can't sit quietly for 10 minutes without turning to look at the stupid thing. And I'm talking about myself too. I do this. I mean, I, I understand. Um, and then, you know, we have good excuses as to why we keep it in our pocket and we hold on to it. I mean, my excuse is that I'm married and I have children. And so if I, if I decide to put that thing away for two hours so that I can have some contemplative time, well, what happens if there's an emergency? How will they get in touch with me? Um, it's a, it's what we used to call a vicious circle, you know, <laughs> um, a vicious circle of sin and death. But anyway, um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. Um, but I think our attention span, there's no question. And I mean, you guys in religious life know this better than I do. There's no question that, that the, the human attention span is changed from what it used to be. And it's been changed by the internet and by devices. And I don't know how we get that back. I mean, I don't know if we do get that back. It might be that we have to just reconfigure how we approach or how we do things like uh, the contemplative side of our faith, or we do, we have to participate as communities in something quite radical. So I, I don't know, I, I don't know, it's above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about uh, sainthood, um, you know, what it means to be a saint and your chapter on leaving sainthood behind? Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I have great interest in saints. I've written a bunch of books about saints and I've written about sainthood itself. And I mean, for instance, I wrote a book a little while ago about Nicholas Black Elk, um, a uh, uh, Oglala Sioux uh, indigenous man from... Uh, North America, who is now, his cause for canonization is now active in Rome. Um, he was both a medicine man and a Catholic catechist of great renown. Um, and I was attracted to his story because of all the reasons that are fascinating about his story, but also because his cause for canonization is now active. And I find that very interesting. Um, in my discussion of Merton, I talk about leaving sainthood behind in the sense that I, I think we should forget about the idea that he's going to become a Roman Catholic saint because I think that's not going to happen. Um, I can't imagine that happening for a whole variety of reasons, but I don't think that diminishes his importance. In fact, in the minds of that reader that at the very beginning I said that I was trying to reach, you know, that 21st century reader who is, gen who is most often unmoored from religion today, Frankly, it's probably to his benefit that he's not a Catholic saint. Um, uh, some of us would find it appealing if he was a Catholic saint, but for a lot of people, they'd find it less appealing uh, because when you become a saint, it makes it feel as if they are sort of removed or unlike us, which of course is not true, but that's, that's the kind of understanding that many people have. Um, but I mean, generally speaking, a cause for canonization begins locally, um, a diocese puts forward a cause, uh, the bishop uh, promotes the cause with fellow bishops, 
they agree to undertake it in a formal way, which means that investigations are, are undertaken into the life of the candidate and everything that the candidate ever wrote or said, it becomes very exhaustive. And then once uh, everyone is satisfied that this is a person who seems to be of uh, virtuous and heroic and exemplary quality, um, it then becomes even more official with uh, postulators of, that's what they're called, postulators of the cause of canonization. And, the, and then eventually it gets sent to Rome and then we look for miracles that happen uh, through the intercession of that figure and so on. And it becomes this you know, whole process and it can go on of course for centuries. Um, the, the cause for canonization can begin as it did with Nicholas Black Elk a few years ago and it can not ever end. Or you know, in the case of someone like Mother Teresa, uh, it can end very quickly and she can become St. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta very quickly, um, or as happened with uh, Pope John Paul II. Um, that's, on, that's very uncommon historically for it to happen quickly like that. Usually it's a long process. But all of that to say, in my chapter on this, uh, in my book on Thomas Merton, I, I suggest for all of the reasons that I talk about him in the book that I don't think sainthood is an issue for him. And frankly, I don't think it would add any of the importance uh, that we find in Merton for our lives today for him to become a saint. Excellent. Thank you for that, John. And then before we go today, you know, are there any other vital elements to the book or hey, Father Merton's body of work that you would like to leave us with today? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I think we've covered a lot of the I think we've covered a lot of the, the things that I like to cover. Um, uh, I begin my book talking about when he died. Uh, he died in December of 1968. And I, and I begin my book talking about the last lecture he gave uh, right before he died, where he talks about how he's talking to fellow monastics. Um, and so those in religious life, I think, in particular, find this interesting that, you know, he says we cannot rely on structures anymore. And it's, it's, it has fascinated people ever since this, this talk he gave this, you know, this monk who had been involved in the structure of a very, very organized monastic life for 30 years, uh, talking to fellow monastics from the East and the West about how uh, we might be on our own in the future. Uh, we can't rely on structures. And he, um, there's a way in which I think this speaks to uh, the present and the future where, you know, I think the church is becoming smaller. I think, um, I think the structures of the church are becoming decentralized. I think the structures of the church uh, are less than they were, are diminished. And I think we spend too much time focusing on how terrible that is, what a loss that is, uh, lamenting our loss of influence and so on. I don't think Merton would see it that way. I think Merton would see it as an evolutionary process and maybe see the spirituality that is possible uh, in the loss of influence, in the loss of structures, because there's a lot of, there can be a lot of problems with structures too. And anyone who has studied history and looked at the history of Christendom can certainly point to those problems as well. So anyway, that's just, I don't know, that's one little maybe sort of slightly provocative thing I'd be happy to leave everyone with <laughs> <laughs> from Thomas Merton. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, everybody at home. We appreciate it also. Uh, remember, you can like, share, and subscribe. And uh, just before you go, John, where can viewers uh, get the latest book and where can they follow you and your work? Uh, well, to get the latest, the latest book, is the book is Thomas Merton, An Introduction to His Life, Teachings and Practices. And I think the best answer is you can get it wherever you buy books. Um, I know it's readily available. Um, it's from a big publisher. And so, you know, it's available wherever you find books. And uh, my work more generally, uh, I don't have, I, I used to keep, I used to keep a website and I decided I was tired of doing that. So I, I don't have a neat website to point you to, but if anyone ever does a Google search on John M. Sweeney, I think you can find things pretty easily. And I thank you for doing that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, John. Again, uh, as Daniel said, remember to like, to share and subscribe in order to support Member Prairie. And from August onwards, you'll be able to donate if you wish. 
And of course, you can give us a visit in person. You can avail from our surveyed hospitality, our museum, our library, our beautiful castle in Valley Park. And thanks again, um, John, and thank you, Daniel. God bless you.